Hi, welcome to Expert Access. My name is Peter Mosmans and I'm your host for today. Today we have a very special guest, John Elliott. John Elliott is really good at writing useful documents. John. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. By that, do you mean I do governance, risk and compliance? Indeed. Okay. And so, well, what do you do? I mean, I guess you're wearing a hoodie. Are you a hacker? Actually, I am, yes. I work in security as well, and I'm actually the one finding security vulnerabilities at companies. Okay. We should both probably point out that we're both plural site authors as well. I write courses on governance, risk and compliance, on PCI DSS, and on um, general data protection regulation. And you? I've done some courses on secure coding, penetration testing, and threat modeling. Threat did you, did you modeling. notice the accent? Yeah, I did. I, I practiced in that yeah, one. Yeah, it's really good. Actually, what's one of the really great things about doing stuff for Pluralsight is that you, you learn different things. Um, so today, I think we should talk about some of the natural, or what do we call it, the natural tension sometimes between a governance, risk, and compliance team and uh, an operational pen testing vulnerability assessment team. Because I know we've had lots of talks about that in the past, that you just think we write nice looking documents and you do security. Well, the, the fun thing is when you perform a penetration test, and I often perform penetration tests or review penetration tests, then you work for companies who ask you to do a penetration test um, who are all compliant to all the different um, things that are actually in scope. And then we as a team think, hey, why do we find so many vulnerabilities if they're still compliant? How does that work? Does it actually make sense to be compliant? Gosh, I mean, that's, but I mean, firstly, it's great that you find vulnerabilities because one of the things that people often get wrong about a penetration test is it's like a test and it's a good thing that you have to pass. And if you find a vulnerability, it's a fail. Now, a penetration test is really just one way of discovering vulnerabilities in your environment. If, like, if you didn't find vulnerabilities, then you wouldn't be a very good penetration tester. True. That's the first thing. Because the whole point is you should find vulnerabilities. Because nothing is ever perfect. Compliance, unless you're in certain particular industries, compliance is often a, a point in time exercise. And depending on what you're compliant with doesn't necessarily make sure that you're always secure. Um, and if you're compliant with, say, one standard, but the standard was written six years ago, right, but you only need to be compliant with that, then your compliance and security is six years old. So penetration testing is what I call an assurance activity. It's not, it's not, it's not the way you run security for your organization. So I guess let's take it back to first principles, OK? The reason we write nice documents like policies and procedures is to make sure that as an organization, we, we understand what security we want to do and we dis we're committed to doing it. We don't all have limitless budgets for security, okay? So we need to work out how much money we've got and therefore what's the best use of that money to spend on security stuff that we're going to do. Can I stop you right there? You just did. You, when, when you say about budgets, um, I'd argue to say that budget is often better spent uh, by performing more often penetration tests than putting it into becoming compliant or staying compliant or uh, paying um, assessments or auditor in order to make sure that you actually follow the right guidelines. Let's first of all take the fact that there's two sorts of compliance. There's compliance with what we said we want to do as an organization. That's our internal security policy. That's based on two things. What risks we see out there. And secondly, what obligations we have to the outside world. And in terms of obligations, that could be, I've signed a contract with somebody that said, I'll do this security. And the other obligation could be, I'm governed by laws and regulations in the environments we operate in. And the laws and regulations say, I have to comply with this particular standard, or I have to do a certain thing. So compliance is like a double thing. It's like, do I comply with what I want to do? And am I compliant with things that I've promised other people I'm going to do? And I think you often think about it when you, when you talk about compliance as compliance with what I, like a SOC 2 or an ISO 27001 that I've, that I've said to, often to other people that I'm going to do as well. So, so, so firstly, it would be absolutely stupid to, have, to do no security, hire a pen tester every month who would find some stuff to fix, and then just go and fix that. 
Because now the pen tester is saying, well, we think this is the priority or we think this is the priority. But in an organization, you have different levels of risk. Some systems have got more sensitive information than other systems. Some systems are sat on the internet and therefore have a greater attack surface to the outside world. Some systems are sitting right inside my organization. No, and we're not talking zero trust. Some systems are sitting right inside my organization. But actually, if somebody had got access to it, there's probably not much damage they're going to do to the organization or to the humans whose data we process as an organization. Let me give you an example. I used to work for an airline. I used to do um, information security in an airline. And, and airlines, as you probably know, get inspected regularly by, in America, the FAA, and in Europe, by the European regulators. Would you be really happy flying with an airline whose only test of airworthiness was not their engineering principles, was not the fact that they had policies and procedures about when they fixed an aeroplane, like, like they took an aeroplane, uh, an engine off an aeroplane and put it back, that they had a way of doing it, that somebody internally checked it, that they made sure all the tools were back in the cabinet before the aeroplane was allowed out. Would you be happy if none of that happened and they relied on the FAA coming in once every few weeks and having a look at the aeroplanes? Well, there's the thing of self-regulation, of course. Um, but um, I think the airline industry is, is a great example. However, that's an, an example of an industry um, which is, has security very on a very high level. Yeah. If, if you compare that, say, with the, the healthcare industry or maybe the, the banking world, I think there, um, you have different things. But it's about risk, because the risk of an aeroplane falling out of the sky is quite a high impact to A, whatever it lands on, and B, all the people on the aeroplane. And actually, if you go back 20 or 30 years, when air aviation was deregulated in the US, a lot of those stuff wasn't in place. And aeroplanes did have a lot of accidents. And so a lot of the processes that the aviation industry put in place are things that we can really learn from in information security. And actually, what the FAA does is they don't go and look at individual aeroplanes. They don't go and say, oh, I'll go and inspect this aeroplane today. What they look is at the systems and procedures and policies that the airline has for how it does engineering. And I think that's one of the things that we miss in security is that a lot of compliance is based on, I'm going to go and test that control today, rather than, I'm going to try and work out how this organization does security well, and I'm going to work out how it tests it contro its controls are working on a regular basis. And then more importantly, what it does when things don't, don't work. In, in the airline, in aviation, people do a lot of causal factor analysis, or root cause, or we might call it root cause analysis, to find out why something failed, to see, like, can we learn from it? And actually, that's one of the things that I love from penetration tests, is when I get a pen test, it's not just, I'm going to fix that vulnerability, but how's that vul should that vulnerability exist in my organization? And in some cases, yeah, it was a zero day, well, not a zero day, but it was something that was discovered really recently, uh, and, we, and we didn't patch it, or we weren't aware of it, or the application went through the CICD pipeline and it passed all our tests, but you, as a really clever pen tester, found something, right? Oh, well, that's interesting. So you found something that I would have actually preferred that, you, that, we, that wasn't there. So the important thing is not fixing it, I mean, yes, fixing it's important, but the important thing from a GRC perspective is I'd expect somebody to look and say, okay, how did that end up in prod? Because actually we have the right systems and processes that that shouldn't have got there. You as a QA, an assurance function, found something that, well, I, I, we should have caught that earlier. Why didn't we catch it earlier? Did we have the right level of training in place? Is our code scanning in CICD OK? You know, do, should we be using more dynamic analysis rather than static analysis? What, why, why did that happen? And actually, the joy, I think, of pen testing is for us to be able to do causal factor analysis and get better at our processes to make our organization secure. It's not just finding the vulnerability and fixing the vulnerability. It's finding the vulnerability risk assessing and fixing the vulnerability according to a prioritized scale, but also saying, w would we have expected that to be there? And that's what I think is really important. So I absolutely agree that the organization, sh in my opinion, should pen test more regularly. Because it's better to pay you to do a security assurance exercise than it is to get a free one from a criminal group or a hostile nation state. I mean, they a are- A free one. A free one, you don't pay for them. Well, you don't pay for them up front anyway, okay? So I think pen testing is a really good assurance function. And I think more organizations should do more of it and they should red team um, and- Continuous penetration testing. Not, 
more or less, or more than... The... De depending on the sophistication of the organisation. I, I also find that, and this is a terrible thing, that, that penetration testing and red teaming are really good ways of getting senior non-IT managed or non-technology management's attention. I, the, the, these people spent five days and they came into our organisation and they stole this and this and this and this. That means our, our, if a criminal was going to do that, we've got a pretty low bar for them to get over. We need to raise that bar so they go somewhere else. That was actually the, the next point I, I wanted to um, bring to our attention here. In my experience, um, the companies who ask for more penetration tests are generally more secure aware companies where there's more of a security culture and yeah. everybody's involved within um, security. So everybody knows their role, the, the general risk, uh, what's happening. And sometimes when companies are more of a standard type, and I'm now pointing to you as a GRC person, yeah. um, there you see that there's more of the feeling of a top-down structure, and when you then perform a penetration test, it's often that fingers are being pointed to those pesky developers who made the vulnerability sure. in the first place. And then you have this clash of cultures. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you often see that, but I mean, part of that is, 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 is number one is that horrible word at the end of penetration test, which is test, because we've all been trained from about age three or four that tests are things you have to pass, right? And so, so, so there's a natural bad language, and you're looking at me, and it, but it's really serious. Yeah, no, I, I, because, I agree. Because I, management I say, oh, we, we fail our pen test. No, we learned lots of stuff from our pen test. We didn't fail it. You, it was you a can't brilliant fail pen a test. penetration test. But As in, a, pen, a penetration tester can fill by not doing its job yeah, properly, but that's you right. cannot fill. The second thing is, and this is sometimes comes from pen testers, of like go, yay, look, we got root, we broke in, aren't we brilliant, aren't you all useless? Um, so often a lot of pen, penetration testers actually start that exercise of using pejorative language about, look how easily we broke into your organization. Aren't we wonderful and aren't you not very good? And you'll have seen that working in the industry. That starts, and that, and it, for junior GRC people or people who aren't very experienced, that will rub off on them of like, yay, look what we did. We hired this pen tester and we found the things. And of course the developer or the infrastructure or the DevOps teams, no one likes being told that, that something they did wasn't right. So first of all, you have to get a culture of security that we're all in this together and that we will have tests and that we'll find stuff. You know, from a GRC perspective, I'll have audit assessments and they'll find stuff that goes wrong with what we're doing. Right? I, I love the fact that you say uh, working together because that's also my experience that um, you have to try to not make it an us versus them but get everybody involved and it's not a pointing fingers, it's not a blame game. Yeah. But speaking about uh, working together, how would you think penetration testers would become better at understanding exactly what people who are really good at writing useful documents do? That's a really good question. Can I do two things? One is language. One is the language of how penetration testers engage with the organization. About it, we're, we're an assurance function, we're doing discovery, right? And no, discovery. Yeah, and no. You know, I mean, yes, it's great when you get root, right? Especially if it's taking you three days, right? Um, it's always a nice it's feeling, a, to be honest. So, yes, I, I understand that lovely feeling, but it's about having that lovely feeling, but without being celebratory. Snarky. Snarky, um, like, aren't we the best? You know, it's not, because it, it, that, that rubs off on the whole engagement. Um, and the second thing is, understand risk, right? Not every vulnerability is actually a risky vulnerability to the organization. Not every organization can patch all the things all the time. Sometimes you make a decision that you're gonna do some segmentation and do some blast radius reduction because you can't patch the thing. Because you actually have, you've got, you, you only have this much bandwidth. You can't, even if you have money, sometimes you have only got a certain amount of bandwidth of stuff you can do. You have to prioritize what it is that you do. And so, you know, I often cry well, not actual cry, but you know, internally cry when I see penetration tests that have got this has got a CVSS score of ninety nine and a half, or or like ten or whatever, right? But it's like, and it's like, yeah, but you've done you, you've done the raw score, you've not done the environmental score, you've not looked at you've not looked at where this is in the organisation. The fact we actually, I mean, I'm glad you I'm glad you pointed out, but that was one we knew about, right? Uh, uh, but they, they, sometimes you get these these tests and they come and do a presentation. It's like. 
everything is terrible because you have this and this and this. It's like, actually, that's on a system with, with last year's uh, something that's not that important. Um, and yeah, you've got root on it, but all the data is encrypted really well and the keys are sitting in an HSM. So yes, you broke into the machine. We knew that might happen because of X, which is why all the data is strongly encrypted and the keys are sitting in a hardware security module. Would you actually then also argue for um, better scoping or better understanding of risk in the first place? Because we penetration testers, we look at technical and operational risk. And that's the only thing actually that we can tell something about, nothing for the rest. Nothing for the business risk. Yeah, correct. And that's one of those problems with those horrible standards like PCI DSS or ISO 27001. So you have to have a pen test. It's like, right? But, but actually, DSS has got much better because it now says you have to have a penetration test methodology and then you have to have a penetration test. The idea being that you could actually define your business criteria in the methodology. Um, and so it, because, but often people just ring up and say, hey, I need a pen test. And that must be really frustrating for you as well. Uh, challenging, right. l l let's call it challenging, yeah, absolutely. Because also sometimes um, you even customers who say, that was for 10, please, that's it. Yeah. Test us against that and then we should yeah, yeah. be good and that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah. So there's also a lot of explaining, and apparently we penetration testers are relatively bad at that, because if, if I understand you correctly, you had some um, less than positive uh, experiences with uh, penetration tests. I've, I've had some great experiences with penetration tests and some terrible experiences with penetration tests. And sometimes I've had some life-changing decisions about like, oh my gosh, do I really want to work here type of decision. Can I tell you an interesting story about penetration testing? Yes, please. I, I was working for this company and I hired a, a team of pen testers I'd had before. Nice people, you know, not celebratory, not raising flags and running around the office going, yay, we did this. And they came after about an hour and said, we got domain admin. And I thought, an hour? I mean, I expected we'd like... Um, like a pass the hat. I mean, the, the Kerberos. I thought, I'm pretty sure we had the Kerberos vulnerability. And so eventually they do something like that. It's like, yeah. I said, wow, that's really quick. You guys are, you know, you must have some new tools. Like, no, we found the domain admin password in your confluence. It's like, okay. That's tough, isn't it? But what could we learn from that? Firstly, do we have a policy? No, no don't laugh. Do we have a policy that says you shouldn't put domain admin passwords in Confluence? Answer, no. Now, do you and I think that's a silly thing to do? Probably. Yes. Does a developer who has got a team of developers with quite a high turnover need to have somewhere where they can share passwords? Probably. Um, and this, this, system, this was a system account which had domain admin privileges. So, so they use Confluence because that's what they use. right? The problem is, number one, we had a system account with domain admin privileges. It probably didn't need it, right? So someone hadn't done some analysis to find out what security that account needed. But secondly, we didn't have a secret server, right? So, so, so the learning from it is not to go and tell the developers not to stick. All right. There is some learning from it that says, please don't put admin passwords in Confluence. But the, the thing is, let's do some role-based access control on system and admin accounts, because obviously that's lacking. And secondly, let's go and find a secret service solution, um, some sort of privileged access management tool, or even something really simple, like, a, like some open source. Like, heck, we could just get an open source password manager to begin with and give people access to it. And one of the problems is like, we often ask developers to do really quite hard jobs without giving them the tools to do them securely. And then we get crossed about the fact they've not done it securely. So yeah, we'd write a policy, and we'd write a policy that says all system and admin accounts should only have least privileges, and that passwords should never be stored in plain text anywhere. So yeah, I would write some nice documents about it. Then I would go and train people how, how to use the new tools we had, and then I would probably get something that went through um, my Confluence and Jira and Git and look for secrets, right? So I've learned that I need some tooling, but I do need policies and I do need processes for you want to create a new system and admin, a system or application account. We should have probably an approval process for that, that somebody else looks at it and says it's been created with least privileges and the password is strong and it's been put in the, right? So, so I am gonna write nice, pretty documents. I'm, I'm gonna try and write them short because I don't like long documents. But without that, the problem will happen again. 
and you'll find it again. So there is an important thing about having policies and procedures and training people and providing tools because then developers can do their job securely because we've enabled them to do their job securely and we don't, they don't have to make shortcuts. So th this sounds like an example of a really mature um, security company as in uh, the level that you're doing root cause analysis, looking not just at that developer who put the password in Confluence, but looking at the whole culture and why that happened in the first place. More than one reason. But we have to do that in security. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. So as a takeaway for the viewers, what would you say would be um, best practices to, to make sure that you reach that level of maturity for your uh, organization with regards to security? It's, it's to get much better at looking at causal factor analysis, right? When you point fingers at humans, like the, it, it, most, because we have these things like, oh, the human is the weakest link and the human always makes a mistake. Yes, because we've not created the environment for them to be successful. In aviation, we have a thing called just culture. Where, the, where we need to find out why something went wrong. And so the rule is, basically, in aviation, is if you make a mistake, no one's gonna, no one's gonna, no one's gonna, you're not going to get in trouble for saying, I think I made a mistake, because the, the risk is too high, right? And so you need people to be really honest about, you know, we released that, and um, Sally was in charge, and she was really happy with it, and she made a risk-based decision that she was entitled to do to push that into prod, but one of the junior developers had done something really silly. And yeah, so you, but you have to do this causal factor analysis. It's really important. Um, and a lot of security teams just don't have the bandwidth to do that, or they don't have the culture to do that. But again, it, as a penetration tester, you can help. Because you can say, we found this in Confluence. And, you, and maybe you wouldn't put it in your report, but you might put it in your report, because often reports have like recommendations. And, and, write, and you could write a recommendation is, do not put domain admin passwords, I mean, in Confluence, right? Which is probably what you'd write. Not, this is not a good practice to put, yeah. But you could write, this points to a lack of, um, like, is there somewhere they can put it? Um, are they created with least privilege? Right. And if you were to write that in your report, right, that's much more useful than just saying this is something that shouldn't happen. And the reason is that that report will probably go to an audit committee, that report will be shown around. So it gives security a bit more help in actually fix, fixing the, the problem. So if I may summarize uh, your suggestions or recommendations, actually is a blameless culture? Totally. And a more holistic approach for Actually, I think both of our professions, penetration testers as well as those who write really good, uh, useful documents, yeah. um, to work together more. Yeah, absolutely. To look at the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. In partnership. In partnership. Well, that's that's a wonderful way to to end this conversation, John. Thank you very much for uh, for being here, for being our guest. Thank you, Peter. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you again on Expert Access here at Pluralsight.